This is episode number 24 with Ben Lee. The Melissa Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Ben has been making music for 25 years. His catchy, romantic, and spiritual songs have always been like a Trojan horse carrying secret messages about the awakening of consciousness into the mainstream. He continues to share his heart and soul today with his music and all of his creative endeavors. Now, I first met Ben many years ago in his lounge room where I went over for a really beautiful, sacred, spiritual ceremony with one of our mutual friends, Amber. And I'm very grateful that we have been able to reconnect today, many years on. So in today's episode, we chat about his journey from double platinum ARIA award winning music artist to where he is today, conscious parenting the masculine and feminine, the power of love, spiritual awakening, unlocking creativity, plus so much more. For everything that we mention in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 24. I'm very excited for you to dive into Ben's world today. He is a beautiful, heart-centered, open, so full of knowledge, beautiful human being. So I'm very excited for you guys to hear from him today. So without further ado, let's dive into this gorgeous episode with the one and only Ben Lee. Welcome, Ben. Before we dive in, can you please tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? Whatever breakfast, I had a selection of gluten-free cereals. I mixed three different kinds together. Yum. And just on their own? Well, with some almond milk. Mm. Before we dive in, let's rewind to 2005, where you were a double platinum ARIA award-winning artist. Basically, you were the talk of the music industry. Fast forward to today, where you are on a very different mission. Tell us about your journey and how it's been and what it's been like for you and what has involved and unfolded over the past few years for you? One of the things I'd say is that the core foundation of my motivation for what I do has actually always been the same. And it really goes back to an experience I had when I was 14 years old, when I came out on stage for the first time, we were supporting Sonic Youth, a big American band. And I had this giant guitar on me and we were a terrible band. This is my band Noise Addict. We, we, we had a lot of chutzpah and a lot of energy, but you know, we were musically just a, sort of a disaster. Um, but we walked out on stage and I saw the audience looking at me like, what is going on? And in that moment, I felt that we were on a very equal playing field I didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what was happening, but we were in it together. And the creation of those sorts of moments has really been what I've endeavored to create throughout my career. So there have been times where the game I've been playing was in a more mainstream setting, times when I was in a more niche underground setting. But the at an emotional level, it was always the same thing. I wanted to sort of blow the lid off what the audience and I thought was possible in any given moment. Mm. And tell me more about your awakening. You know, we, we talk a lot about the spiritual awakening and the rise of consciousness that you have kind of had over the past couple of years. 
What sparked all of this? Without getting too esoteric, when we talk about consciousness being asleep or the need to awaken consciousness, it's quite simple. It's based on a general understanding that we do not know what's going on. We could look at that even on a political level and say, wow, we don't really understand the process of how things have gotten to the place that they're at right now, and we don't really know how to fix it. But then on an interpersonal level with our families, like we don't know, we, we, we hurt each other, we, uh, we find it difficult to tolerate giving love and receiving love. And there's just, for me, it's been more an awakening to a sense of ignorance that I have, and I think a lot of people feel sort of a very common sense of uh, our smallness, you know, how much mystery there really is out there. So for me, this sort of spiritual journey has been very pragmatic in a sense. It's been, I've always had an awareness that I was on an adventure and I didn't really know what was around the next corner, but I've always felt very strongly that there was something calling to me from inside that I had to find my way towards. And that goes back to like the rainbow connection, Kermit the Frog. You know, this is doesn't, you don't need to understand like Buddhism and Hinduism and esoteric Christianity and all these things I've been interested in, in order to grasp that, you know, Kermit the Frog lyric, have, I, have you been half asleep and have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. I've heard them too many times to ignore it. It's something that I'm meant to be, right? Like we've all felt that. And we all remember it as a child. So for me, the journey, what we call the spiritual journey or the philosophical journey, has really been an attempt to find any clues that I could to move towards a mystery that I felt was hidden inside me. Mm. And what do you think that mystery is? Uh, I think it's it's got infinite layers to it because essentially everything out there is also in here. So in the same way that the general understanding of space is that it doesn't have an ending, I think inner space doesn't probably have an ending either and there are infinite levels of intimacy that we can move towards. But we might say it's awareness of, uh, for me it's been my awareness of myself as a creator the thing, the, the, the thought forms, the, the power of imagination, the power of dedication, of like devoting my energy to projects, of shaping them with my mind, and then my reality taking shape based on those uh, directions that I would allow my mind to point in. I think that power is what has been hidden inside me and is hidden inside everybody. The, the awareness of myself as a creator. And really, this is all, all mystical paths, all spiritual paths said truly the same thing. God is inside us. The creator is inside us. And we have to learn how to be that which we are, but that's sort of hidden behind a curtain from us. So that's been, that's been the journey. What do you think the repercussions of suppressing that power within or that creativity within, what do you think the repercussions are for us when we do that? Well, it's a funny thing because, you know, Freud said that all culture and society, civilization is built on repression. And in a sense, I think that's true, that the repression of our true power as creators is what allows us to have almost like cultural dynamics and everyday life and beautiful things and ugly things that are created in the world. So it's not a question of if we repress it, we all repress it. We, none of us are living in our full potential as creators. We're just, we're moving towards that hopefully with each day. So I don't look at it as like, I, I know there's like, you can look at it in terms of, oh, disease comes from the repression. Of, but I look at it in terms of like, we're basically all diseased. Like that's mortality. Um, we, we're all, we're all out of touch with what we really are. And we're just you know, we're trying to walk each other home. We're holding hands and we're bearing witness to each other and we're supporting each other where we can and collaborating. Um, so I just like to focus on the joy 
of slowly uncovering the power of ourselves as creators. Mm. And for someone who wants to uncover that more, like how can they do that? Do you have any any advice or any tips of how they can step toward that even more? Well, uh, if I'm entirely honest with you, I'll say it would be a lie of me to tell you there's anything I can suggest because the clues are going to be hidden in their own life. The clues are going to be hidden in their own consciousness, in their own intuitions, in their dreams, in their imagination. So, and we know this, like all the, the, you know, the ancient Greek myths, they all revealed this hero's journey. And what does that mean? A hero's journey is a journey that no one else can tell you how to do. We each have to truly take this very bizarre journey towards our own truth. And I, I've seen, I've explored a lot of systems, you know, like I, I went through much of my life very interested in systems, religious systems, meditations, mantras. Um, these are all ways that are supposedly designed to help you unlock the truth, yoga, you know, all these types of things. But I've really come to feel that they're all approximations um, because there cannot be one way for two identical ways for two people to find their own truth. It's a very personal journey. I think some of these things can assist us, but it's kind of all there because as soon as you get into like systems deeply, like whether say you look at Christianity, which is a beautiful system, but sooner or later you get people interpreting it. Well, if you haven't heard the story of Jesus, you can't possibly become enlightened. And intuitively we know that there are people born in parts of the world that they have not yet heard that story. And it can't be that enlightenment is out of their reach just because that cultural narrative hasn't reached them. And the same thing with yoga and the same thing with mantras. They can work to a degree, but I think the truth, the path has to be in our own life, doing our own life in integrity, with vigor, with imagination, with a certain type of like, cunning almost, you know, <laughs> a certain type of like, um, a certain type of psychological ruthlessness where we actually want to know the truth and we're willing to sacrifice for it. And what that looks like is going to be very different for everybody. And how do we on that path, you know, I see it a lot and especially, you know, myself in my early twenties, I would get really stuck in that egotistical comparison to other people, you know, they're doing this and they're doing meditation. And I also felt for me personally, like if I didn't do those things, I wasn't enlightened or I was broken. And that was something that I really had to be incredibly mindful of. And I, I see it a lot that people on this journey, on this awakening spiritual journey, they feel broken. We're not broken. Like you said, it's just taking steps toward our true path, not comparing ourselves to others. Even when things are broken, there's a question of mindset in relation to the discovery of our brokenness, right? Like, what you're talking about, I think, isn't just a feeling of being broken. It's a feeling of being bogged down in the brokenness, like losing the motivation to move on. But I think one of the best qualities as parents, say, we can teach our children is to keep trying, to keep putting in effort and to, you know, literally fall off the bike, you get back on it. Because there are times we make mistakes, And particularly if you start going on the path of self-discovery and personal development, I guarantee guarantee you, you will get dragged. You'll go up the garden path a few times. You'll follow someone who makes you a shiny promise and you'll buy into it and you'll waste a year or two and you'll, you know, and you can get into the whole argument of, well, everything happens for a reason and, you know, but whatever, we make mistakes. I don't really, I don't have a problem with that. The issue is not, do we make mistakes? Are we possibly broken? Are we traumatized? Are we damaged? Yes, we are. <laughs> but so what? What are we going to do today? We got to like lift up our heads, stand up, be strong, and move again with a sense of courage 
and a sense of hope into our next effort. It's like relationships. Like, you know, there are people who have one love of their life and they get their heart broken and they never get over it. They just hold onto it and it becomes, it like crystallizes as bitterness. And then there are the rest of us who get our hearts broken and we go, I'm going to try even harder next time. I'm going to be more open next time. I'm going to love more. And that I think is a, it's a more optimistic response. <laughs> mm. So let's talk about relationships. What do you think are the purpose of our relationships? The purpose of relationships, I have no idea, except that love does seem to be electric. Love does seem to be fuel for anything you want to achieve. I mean, literally, the creative act, sex, you know, it's connected to love. It's connected to the desire to, to have union with someone, to, to, to express affection, it's the poetry and romance. And for whatever reason, like I, I looked at this when I started like investigating people that have been very successful in business or something. And you find 90, I'd say over 90% of them are married. And it's not, I don't think it's like a moral thing of, well, oh, you have to be married or you're an outcast. And, you know, I get it. Some people don't want partnership in that way, but there is a pattern. Like I like when people say success leaves clues. Because you can look at patterns of success and go, well, something's going on there. There's obviously some a way that this person who has a very big mission in the world, who wants to achieve something in the world out of their house, whether it's with a business or politics or social justice or charity or whatever, that coming home to a partner who both humbles you but has compassion for you and supports you, there's a type of love and electricity there that it's like a creative matter. So the way I think about love and partnership, it's almost more like if you wanted to do a painting, how do you feel about a canvas? How do you feel about an easel? How do you feel about, a, about paint? To me, it's one of the ingredients from which we can build anything we want. Mm, that's really beautiful. I've never heard anyone explain it so beautifully like that. It's really nice because I absolutely agree. And I've got my next book, which is all about deep love relationships and soulful sex, which is coming out next year. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you share that love with another being, it is electric you become this, you know, powerful force together to create in the world. And it's really beautiful. And I feel that with you and your wife as well. How long have you guys been together? Uh, I think this year we'll have been married nine years and together for 11. Beautiful. And when I'm curious to know, I love a good love story. When you first got together, did how was that? Take us back to that moment. Like, did you just know, you know, how did you feel? Well, we met 10 years before we went out on a date. Whoa! So we, so we were friends, not super close friends, but we were in each other's social circles. In fact, I met Ioni when I was 18 and she was 26. And if you've ever been an 18-year-old boy – you'll know how we look at 26 year old women. They are women, you know? <laughs> so, so I had no concept that we would end up together. <laughs> um, I felt like a child. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, when we really reconnected 10 years later, I was 28, she was 36 and it felt more, you know, that, that, that gap narrows obviously. And uh, it, it's mysterious. It's very mysterious. I don't know. We saw something in each other. We've helped each other so much, but in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. So there must be some intuitive sense that I want to be near this person. I, I don't know. I want what they have. There's something this person has that I want. I want to be part of. I want to genetically. I want what they have genetically encoded in my children. 
there's something in that, right? They're like the smelling the pheromones and the genetic diversification. And I think similarly, spiritually and psychologically, we meet people with hopefully with complementary skills and insights and abilities. And I, I know for me to this day, I only, I mean, this is classic. I don't know. I never read men are from Mars, women are from Venus, but I, I do feel that to this day, 11 years into being together, not a day goes by where I don't look at something I only does and go, I would not do that that way. <laughs> it's, it's fun. To, and I know she feels the same about me. We, we truly see the world differently, but in that, the respect that can be you gathered, she, she says a lot of the time, one of the words that she always felt with picking a partner that she doesn't hear people talk about a lot is admiration, that you should be with someone you admire. And I really can say that with her. There are qualities about her that I admire so profoundly and that I hope to integrate into who I am by the end of this lifetime. Um, but I, so I can't say I knew right away, but at some level I felt this person is interesting. <laughs> mm. And of course, along your journey, you know, we're always growing and evolving. How have you guys held space for each other when the other may have been going through something or how have you done that? Because I think it really takes you know, courage to hold space for someone who may be going through a really big personal shift. How have you guys done that for each other? You know, I've passed through a number of these types of spiritual schools that I've been interested in. And the last one I left, I said, <laughs> for the sake of my wife, I am never joining another cult. <laughs> because <laughs> what she's had to go through <laughs> with me and my passion for uh, spirituality and philosophy and stuff. So, I mean, I honestly think that's a question for her. She, she's been very patient. But there have been other things like... Um, you know, she smoked for a number of years when we got together and neither of us saw that as an ideal atmosphere that we wanted to like raise children in and, you know, um, but it was where she was at. And something I never did was I never lectured her about it. Um, I think intimacy is so interesting and this comes back to that electric juice that comes from love that sometimes in silence, in loving someone, they can actually hear their own inner voice if you shut up. So often it's not what your partner says, oh, you've got to change, you've got to, do, you've got to do that. If they love you and they're patient, you begin to feel your own sense of, I need to change, I need to stop this. And we've both watched this in each of our lives play out numerous times. And now we don't try as much as maybe we did when we first got together to like tell each other everything you're doing wrong, you know, <laughs> all that kind of thing. And let, let your partner have an experience. Let them have a journey. It's almost the biggest gift you can give someone is just the right to have a journey. Mm. Same with your children, hey? Yeah, yeah. My husband's parents have been married for close to 50 years now. And same with my parents, they've been married for about 40 years. And when Nick and I were, we got married three and a half years ago, I asked and I kind of almost surveyed these people who had been married for a very long time and asked them, what were their secrets, you know, and, and could they share them with me? And both my parents and Nick's parents said, very similar to what you said, not so much admiration, but they said a deep respect, you know. They don't always agree with what the other person is doing, but there's an underlying, this is what my, my mother-in-law said to me, there is a deep respect for one another. And that overshadows 
everything. And I think that's really beautiful, very similar to the admiration. You just have that. That's kind of like the core foundation that everything is built upon. And and I think, you know, if anyone asks me, you know, what's the key to mine and Nick's relationship, it is I, I respect him deeply. Beautiful. That's beautiful, isn't it? And yeah, it's really like, you know, the urge to correct and manage other people is something that really, I think, interferes with a lot of relationships. Mm. Uh, You really see people just becoming, like, monitoring each other. Um, I I, I remember hearing a joke. I can't remember which comedian said it. There's a comedian I saw recently who said, I've just gotten married. I I really, I really like it. I've never been supervised before. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) you know, a lot of times I think men also feel that too. Just the constant, like just the men and the women, like constantly like poking at each other as if your job is to tell this person everything they're doing wrong and creative collaboration. I think for artists, we've had to learn this. It, It really becomes part of our trade that in creative collaboration, how do you bring the best out of somebody? You know, yes, you have a vision, but you also have to recognize them and give them hope. And if you recognize somebody, if someone sees, feels seen and someone feels hopeful, the best will come out of them. You know, it's not by just constantly cutting them down. It's so true. I am reading a book. Um, I have an 11 year old stepson named Leo and, uh, I'm reading, I'm always reading parenting books. I love them. I'm reading an amazing one at the moment called The Conscious Parent. I don't know if you've, you've read it, but it's really great. And she's just saying the exact same thing. Like, stop supervising your children. Like, stop helicopter parenting them and watching over them and telling them what they do. And, you know, there's, so many people that helicopter their partners. But like you said, if we can hold space for them to just fully be the full expression of them, that's when they truly flourish. That's when they show up as the best version of themselves. And I see it. Like as soon as I take a step back and I just hold space for Nick or Leo, the things that they create or just the way that they show up or the way that they serve someone else, it blows my mind. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, parenting is so juicy, you know, it really is like if you had a trace of being a know-it-all, um, it's going to bring it out in you and you're going to get cut down, you know, <laughs> it's like it can't survive because it's so full of mystery. <laughs> You've got, have you just got one daughter or? So I have a, I have a daughter who's seven. I have a 15 year old stepdaughter. Ah, oh, beautiful. So you understand the step parenting world. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about the roles of the masculine and feminine energy. This is something that I, I talk a lot about, especially in my new book that's coming out. I never really understood the power and the potency of understanding these different roles within myself, because we all have the masculine and we all have the feminine, and then understanding it within my relationship with my husband and all of my relationships. But how has that played out for you with your wife? And, you know, how has understanding that concept or you know, played out in your life and, and how do you move through both the masculine and the feminine? Well, for me, when I think of, uh, in my own psyche, uh, the masculine has focus and gets it done. Um, it's a doer. The masculine knows how to push out into the world and make things happen. But if you don't have the balance of the feminine, which is the intuition and the mystery and the receptiveness, then the action that you take from the masculine side of you, it's sort of empty. It's superficial, right? It's like, it's like I can come up with 10 ideas for a song right now, like I'd force myself to, and I could get one written because I'm disciplined enough with my craft 
And I'd get it finished, I'd sing you a song, it would be pleasant enough. But that would be a very masculine exercise, right? To incorporate the feminine, the, re the receptivity in me is at the right moment and the right time to actually feel that something very quiet is speaking within my heart and that I will serve that and I will allow the masculine to express out into the world that which I am very gently receiving within the feminine part of my psyche. So for me, maybe for a lot of men, the danger is that we become so good in the world. You know what mm. I mean? We can like, we Doing. can get it done. Yeah. We can, yeah, when we're good with, you know, we'll get, tell you how to get there and where the car's parked and how the bills get paid and, you know, all these kind of like traditionally male things. But we can get so cooped up in effectiveness that we're actually moving without inspiration. Mm. And similarly, I see a danger sometimes for women because they've been so historically identified with the feminine is that women will be so full of inspiration and uh, so connected to the feminine and moved emotionally, subtle shifts in emotion and vibration, the dream world. These things are like so deeply felt by many women. But if they're not balanced within the masculine, within the psyche, how do you put those instructions into action? What do you do with them? You've got, you've got these raw materials. You've received them. Now, can you finish the job? Can you build something for your children? Can you build something for the next generation? Can you write your story down? You know, so I think both of these things is so crucial that we're like firing on all cylinders and we really do have both sides working within us. Absolutely. I totally agree. It's um, definitely played out in my life and understanding this has been really quite powerful in my business and also in my relationship. It's, it's really beautiful to see. Going back to conscious parenting or whatever you want to call it, what are your hmm, parenting tips or tricks or any sort of parenting advice you can give us? I'm parenting to the best of my abilities, just like my neighbors are and everyone else I know. Um, okay, let's use this masculine and feminine, right? The masculine in parenting is important because the kids feel safe with guidance, with protection, with a sense of right or wrong. But the feminine, will, the parent will be receptive to the children and to the children's direction, to the children's hunches to their tastes, to their interests. But if we veer too much to that side, they can become indulged. So it's very similar, how do I make art? How do I parent? How do I build a business? How do I have a conversation on a podcast with you? I told you I noticed myself interrupting you before, right? That was my masculine I couldn't contain the inspiration that I felt in that moment that I was receiving on a feminine level and the masculine just needed to interrupt and make my mark and make it immediately. So I've always believed that how you do anything is how you do everything. I'm not sure that parenting is, obviously it's really intense because the stakes are so high, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like you're, I mean, it's amazing. It's like you've shown up for your first day directing a movie or something and it's like a $200 million superhero blockbuster and you have no idea what to – I mean, you know, it's like the stakes are like incredibly, incredibly high and it's even more so than that because we're talking about a human life and feelings. Um, but I try and do it by the same principles I do everything else, which is from the heart and from the mind. That balance of the masculine and the feminine. Yeah. What do you think the purpose of us being here is? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is one of the things that I've, um, I've kind of become increasingly more comfortable with. I guess if you know the end of a story, you relax into the reading of it 
in a different way than if it's truly unknown. So, so it's like the way we hold ourselves in the not knowing appears to me to be the part of this that is the we're like accountable for. I don't think we, it's demanded of us. It doesn't seem that it's demanded of us by nature, by the universe, by the gods, by spirit. It doesn't seem demanded of us to know everything. It just seems impossible, right? It seems like being comfortable with not knowing. I love in the, um, the ancient Greeks, I think they had one statue to the unknown God, which I love that idea. That was some of their prayers would go to the unknown God because it was an idea that even with this whole pantheon of mythological figures, they were never going to know them all. And part of this whole thing is how do we handle not knowing? And what I've come to see is that in making art, in parenting, in building a business, the way you handle the unknown is everything. Your composure, your dignity, your, uh, your equilibrium while you're in the unknown is actually what gives you credibility because no one wants to work with someone who like can't handle the process. So, <laughs> so my interest is not in necessarily at this point figuring out the meaning of existence. It's figuring out how to hold myself in integrity in the not knowing. And that really includes being open to many possibilities. And I think that's actually what's really interesting about this experience. You've really inspired me there because I recently had a situation and the way that I held myself through that situation was definitely, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not, not graceful, that's for sure. So, and you're so right, Ben, you know, how we hold ourselves, how we carry ourselves through maybe that tumultuous divorce or the bankruptcy or whatever it is, how we move through that, that is what really counts. And that's what you really admire in someone. And I'm always looking at my husband because he, through the same situation that I was referring to, he just elegantly danced through it with such ease and grace as he does. And I look at him and I'm like, oh, and here I am <laughs> on the other side, stressed and not graceful at all. But it's, it's really beautiful. You have inspired me to, to really look at the way I move through those times. So thank you so much for that. Well, a couple of things. Remember, fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. Mm. failure is the whole name of the game with success in every, even spiritually, even psychologically, right? Like unless you're willing to try, you're never going to make the mistake that you're going to get the correction from. So I, I go, when I hear a story like that and now knowing you a little bit, I say, I know that that lack of dignity was, it's a learning experience for you. Absolutely. And you're going to correct it. You're mm -hmm. going to rectify it. Absolutely. And I can laugh at it. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh at it. So I just, I say, throw yourself into situations that are going to bring out that <laughs> more and do it more quickly and you'll, you'll refine yourself more. And also I just, the other thing about, yes, the divorces and all those things, but at a more fundamental level, the fact that you have atheists who do not believe in God there is nothing out there. This is a purely material world, right? And then there are like fundamentalist religious people who will actually tell you exactly what God looks like, exactly what he, she, it is doing right now, and exactly what's going to happen to you if you do or don't believe it. So these are like extreme ends of the spectrum, which for me are really people who cannot tolerate that they don't know. And how little we know, this is how we started the conversation, that moment of realizing how little we know. I'm in love with that moment. And I don't see that as a failure. I don't know what happens when I die. And I'm not really doing my behaviors based on that because I don't know. These all seem like very plausible answers. Um, it being purely physical and just 
being worm food, uh, merging into some greater unity, reincarnation. Uh, these all sound plausible to me in different ways. But I don't have to know because part of the hero's journey, as I see it, is the courage to act on, like act in the face of mystery. And for me, when I reach out to you now emotionally in this conversation, right, I don't really know, like, is this podcast going to be good? I don't really know, is this going to be good for my career? Is this like a cool thing to be a part of? Is this like you, you wrote me an email, Amber introduced us, we wrote each other an email. I liked the feeling I got from you. I said, let's do it. I'm willing to take the risk of taking action, you know, because you can get so hung up because we don't know. You can become paralyzed and you can say, well, then how can I do anything? If I don't know what the truth is, how can I do anything? And there's a certain type of like moxie or a certain type of like just guts that it feels like we are called on to have in nature where we say, I don't know, but I'm picking a direction and I'm walking that way. And I'll change my path if I hit an obstacle, but nothing is going to stop me moving forward. It's so beautiful. Thank you. And I'm so glad you did come on the show because I'm absolutely loving this conversation so far. And thank you so much for sharing. I'm curious to know now, is there something that you're currently working on or would like to work on within yourself? Maybe it's not interrupting, but is there anything that you've got that, um, yeah, you're working on within yourself at the moment consciously? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the moment, I'm really working on a narrative that I carry that success has to involve huge struggle. Um, you know, we, my wife and I have an essential oils business, and last month we had a huge month where our team really grew and we moved into a certain level of leadership. And as I looked, I did it with kind of a bit of a sense of struggle. It was like, oh, we're going for a goal. We're stretching. We're going for it, you know. And this month, I didn't feel myself stretching in the same way. And I thought, oh, we won't reach the goal. But I'm realizing that we're actually reaching it, but we're doing it with a different type of energy. And what's coming up for me is that I've always gone into a certain type of angst about achievement. And I'm realizing that there's an invitation here from my life. This is what I mean by it's in my life. Like if I told someone else, oh, this is how you get X, Y, Z, you work on what I'm working on. That would be ridiculous because this is coming up for me in my life right now. But there's a door opening. There's an invitation to consider that achievement can be done without angst. And I'm very interested in accepting that invitation. Mm, I'll take that one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always say uh, ease and grace. You know, they're two of my favorite yeah. words. Um, if if I can move through this with, you know, ease and grace, then that would be lovely. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Let's pretend now that you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. What book would you choose? There's a very interesting book. It's, it's got a bit of an unappealing title, but it's called The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Waddles. You know that book? Yeah, I love it. It's a great book. The reason I pick it is because not only is the content just fantastic, um, written over 100 years ago, but it's a short book, it's an easy read, and I think that it's something that, it's information that everybody needs to have. I don't think the, when I talk about coming to realize that we are creators, I don't think of that as an elitist thing that is just for white middle-class people that can afford to go on yoga retreats and be on consciousness websites. This is really information about personal power. Even if you look at political power the way like Nelson Mandela, he realized he was a creator. 
he realized that his actions had consequence and had the power to shape his reality and the whole country's reality. So this type of science of the realization of ourselves as creators, it's really something that I think should be taught very young to kids. And I don't, it's not, it, it gets a little bit confusing because obviously there are different socioeconomic challenges and someone being born into poverty has, that might not even learn how to read. Um, are they going to be touched by this book going into every school? You know? Um, so it's beyond a book. I would love to see there being a, a sense of, what would I call it? Maybe like individual power or responsibility. Maybe that almost being like a syllabus that is taught in schools or that parents teach to teach their children. I know they already do, but to another level, because the impact of one human being can really be immense. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Nick and Leo read together every night and we've started introducing these sorts of texts to Leo and they are currently reading The Science of Getting Rich together, which is really beautiful. And Leo is asking all of these very amazing questions and he, he they started reading it when he was 10 and they are just exploring. You know, we're not forcing it down his throat. We're just reading it with him and just, you know, seeing how he feels, seeing if it resonates, if it doesn't, whatever. But I love what you said. It's about introducing this information at a very young age, not forcing it down their throats, just offering it up to them. Is It's also, it's through example. Exactly. The number one way that you teach your kids is not, and reading's great, you know, playing games is great, telling them, but what they see you do is, is huge. So this is one of the things that I talk to people about a lot is let your children see you create a different reality because that, that will mark their psyche in a way that is irreversible. That's so true. And let your children see you vulnerable. I grew up in a family where it was very Catholic Italian family and my dad very much had the don't show emotion and pull your socks up and keep going forward, you know, bless him. And showing emotion was a sign of weakness. They kind of, that's what they kind of taught us. And I never saw my mum get emotional or cry, even when her brother passed away. Um, you know, she kind of shut the door in my face and went and hid and cried. And that's something that I really had to be mindful of as I was growing up because I, I did the same thing. I, I, you know, I thought it was a sign of weakness and I hid away my feelings and my emotions and really bottled things up. And so with Leo, I, you know, if I'm really emotional, I just let him see that, you know, and of course it feels vulnerable. And I feel like, Oh my goodness, you know, what is what is this? I must look like a mess, but I allow him to see me in that state because and you know what? It's really beautiful. He he softens and he comes and holds me or he just snuggles up next to me and you know, I think it's a really beautiful thing and even though it makes me feel very very vulnerable, um I think it's a really beautiful thing another way that we can model for our children. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about, I love hearing, you know, people's non-negotiables throughout their day or little things that they do that really light them up, whether it's a little morning routine or morning ritual. Do you have anything like that, that you, that you do regularly that really fills you up and lights you up? I don't have non-negotiables. There, there are no two days that are the same. Um, I like the game when it changes and I'm forced to adapt. I used to be very like I woke up and meditated for 20 minutes and, you know, this whole thing, and then I did chanting and, you know. Um, and I, again, I felt it was a very masculine practice. 
Mm. My practices were very much dominated by my masculine. My really what it is for me is trying to stay connected to my heart and trying to maintain a positive mindset throughout the day, regardless of what's happening. I mean, that is, that's, that's, that's the game for me. Mm, beautiful. I love that. It's really interesting that you say that because it's something Nick and I are very much exploring at the moment. I, in the past, have been wake up, scrape my tongue, meditate for 20 minutes, yoga for 10 minutes, you know, gratitude lists and all these things. And although those practices have been hugely beneficial for me on my journey and they're amazing. I'm not discrediting them. I have felt like it's very masculine and another thing to do. So I'd almost like be sitting in my meditation, not soft and in my heart space and present, but like with that mentality of another thing to tick off my self-care list. Right. Well, yeah, totally. And it just becomes like, It's basically like what's the best case scenario is that you come out of it feeling like a good little boy or good little girl. Yeah, you did it. You did it. Good good work. You You showed up. (laughs) Totally. Even though the whole time I wasn't in my heart space or I, I didn't feel soft, I wasn't present. I was almost like, all right, cool. Okay. And sit, go, start the timer. And so Nick and I have over the past couple of weeks, just been practicing. This has been about the last six weeks, actually. Practicing following the charm, we call it. Just following where our heart leads us. Do I want to go for a, you know, we live on Bondi Beach. Do I want to go for a walk now? Okay, let, yeah, that feels good. Do I want to meditate? No, I don't want to meditate. Do I want to sit here on this rock for an hour. Yes, that feels good for me right now. And really letting go and surrendering and softening into my heart space and just following what feels really good in that moment. It's a practice because I've come from the last six, seven years of my life, which is a regular meditator, a very, very gold star girl, you know, and it's, it's felt very pushed. I don't want to go like too far down this rabbit hole, but when you look at particularly things that come within systems, who benefits from the clientele or the disciples being extremely rigorous and non-compromising with their devotion to the practice? The system benefits. Like a system that tells you, use me sometimes, is probably not going to have a lot of repeat customers. A system that tells you, you have to use me to get enlightened. And if you don't, you'll lose your connection. You'll, you know, whatever. It creates like a real like fire and brimstone thing. That's a system that's going to turn into a really good business. So I've kind of seen how like all so many like religious constructs and spiritual systems, they, they're less about giving you a tool that you can reach for when your spirit indicates to you that that's the appropriate moment, but they're really about a certain type of, I mean, I'm going to use a very dramatic word, but there's a certain type of like psychic slavery that occurs when people buy into these rigorous systems. And again, it's all about that they can't handle that they don't know, that we don't know. Well, I don't know, but I know that if I'm meditating twice a day, I'm a good boy and then I'm going to go to heaven. You know, it's like, it's unbelievable how much the terror of us not knowing drives our decisions. (laughs) Mm. And when you first kind of sat in that space, was it uncomfortable for you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's still uncomfortable for me. I'm not saying this as someone that has like full like fully integrated this information. Like, I think it's terrifying. I mean, if my daughter, if I didn't know where she was, like she'd gone with a friend or something and like an hour passed, I didn't know, I wouldn't know where, where she is. And I would be highly, highly uncomfortable. I would not be embracing the not knowing. I would be doing everything I could to figure out how I could know what was going on. Um, 
So I think we innately struggle with it and that's okay. Um, you know, I've been working on this project for the last seven years about um, with this American writer, great writer called Tom Robbins, and we're working on it. We're writing a musical together called Beers for Beer, and it's really about the relationship to the mystery that children have, and they can see grown-ups have lost, and they see grown-ups trying to recapture with things like alcohol. And it's it, this musical, this play has really soundtracked my growing acceptance of the fact that how much there is that I don't know. So it's been interesting. It's interesting when a little artistic project sort of, for me, it's always been like that. Like I write about what I'm interested in and the, the work I make, it's always kind of, um, yeah, it's soundtracking my exploration. Really beautiful. I can't wait to watch that musical and hear more about it. Sounds awesome. I'm curious to know, what are three things you're most recently grateful for in your life? Every day I'm deeply grateful for my marriage. I love my wife so much and I, without being, I don't want to be superstitious, but I really feel like so much of the good momentum in my life is attributed to, attributable to her influence. <laughs> um, she's really, really helped me. And I hope I've done the same for her. I'm very grateful for the awareness of the power of my thoughts. Um, it's been a growing awareness, but at this point I once heard someone say, you don't have the luxury of being able to afford one negative thought. And obviously we have negative thoughts, but the principle is correct that we, it's so important. In a a sense, you could say there's nothing more crucial than learning how to think differently at this point of history. Because it's really interesting when you look at things like the environmental issues going on right now, you have a lot of people who are doomsdayers, you know, just saying, oh, it's too late. There's nothing we can do. The carbon in the atmosphere has surpassed the air. Like, well, you're doing a lot of help, aren't you, with that argument? That's, I mean, you might be right, but you're actually really not helping right now. And the voices of positivity, even like the Elon Musks, you know, the entrepreneurs, they're so hopeful. They believe that it's possible to find new solutions, solutions we hadn't thought of. Um, so the, the, learn, the growing awareness of, of the, the power of thought is, is something I'm incredibly grateful for. And I'm also incredibly grateful for that my work, whether it's music or the oils or speaking or doing the talking to you today, I've, I've always gotten to work on things I enjoy. And I don't know whether that's, that might be my mind. That might just be that I've made them things I enjoy. I've decided to enjoy them because I know there are a lot of people that are musicians or artists and they, they've lost the joy in it or they, it's sort of like torture, you know? <laughs> um, so, but I'd say those would maybe be the three things that come to mind. Beautiful. Now I've got a couple more questions for you. What is one of the most important things that we can do for our health? That's a a good question. I don't, I mean, there's so many things we can do. I suppose just to follow the theme of this podcast, it would be to realize that there isn't one path and that you're in the same way that that quiet voice is speaking inside about your unique psychological journey it's also speaking about your unique health journey. For me, having, I would always get seasonal allergies. And that journey, that narrative has led me to an understanding of natural medicine and the drawbacks of Western medicine, things that I, the side effects of using Western medication, you know, everything has side effects. Um, and I'm not against Western medicine, of course, but if I can reach for something natural, I will reach for it first. And this was all in my life. My allergies happened to me. 
but it got I got to go on a journey because of it. So I wouldn't separate health from the rest of it. The clues are going to be hidden in your life. Mm, beautiful. What is one of the most important things that we can do for wealth? What you do in the world, being wealthy in every area of your life. This this one is, is easy. It's give value, right? Like, do you charge people for this podcast? No. No, right? Do they do they like to buy your books? Yeah, they love my <laughs> After books. They, yeah. yeah. Do they like to do their workshops or whatever it is you're doing, yeah. right? You're giving value and you're trusting. Like there are some people in jobs where they have such a scarcity mentality that they would not think I'm going to talk for an hour on a recording about my most <laughs> insightful thoughts or as insightful as they get for me and give them away for free. Mm. People just wouldn't think like that because they'd come from such scarcity. They'd try and find a way to monetize it too early. Mm. The reason, it's like I've always felt with experts, right? Everybody wants to be an expert. Like you look at, what I don't even know, like you just look at these panels that speak at different conferences and stuff and everyone is so eager to be an expert. And my theory was always, why don't you just get so good at something that people will want to talk to you about it as opposed to trying to brand yourself and position yourself as some kind of expert I mean, at the end of the day, you can only become an expert on yourself, really, um, on your own process. But I think this is really crucial that it's the giving of value that really draws a sort of waves of abundance towards people. And to be to very, it's important to differentiate that doesn't mean undervaluing, like uh, undercharging. Because that is something in sort of consciousness communities and new age communities, you see that a lot. Like people just go, oh, I just can't charge for it. I just can't charge for it. I, I studied for two years to do massage. I can't charge for it. It's just my gift. Well, give value, but don't give yourself away. There's a great cheap trick song where they say, surrender, surrender, but don't give yourself away. Right? Mm. It's the same. It's the same idea that you are entitled to have abundance. But what I like to say is that, like, the people that I want to collaborate with and work with, I just want to be around because I like their energy. I like how they think. I like the value that they add when they walk into a room. That doesn't mean they work for free, but you get value every time you connect with them. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, I, when, I, when I walk into a room, if I go to a party... I intend to have conversations with people and give of myself to the best that I can. I don't know whether they're going to like me or not like me, but I show up intending to add value. And that is, I think, be a value-adding person and you will attract abundance. Mm, couldn't agree more. I love that mentality. I'd love to. I don't know if this is premature, but um, we can speak more vaguely about it. Um, this came up for me this week where when we made contact, you and I, and you are working, you're, you've got a business idea mm -hmm. that potentially if I came from a scarcity mentality, I would see that as competition, mm. right? But I'm really working on adding value and not coming from scarcity. And I was so happy that we got to spend half an hour on Skype with me just adding any input I can add. I don't know whether it'll be useful or not. But had I come from scarcity, I wouldn't have been able to add value. I could only do it because I believe there's enough for all of us. Mm, there's definitely enough to go around. Yeah, yeah. Mm, and I'm very grateful for our chat. It was beautiful. Oh, I, I, was, great. I was grateful too, yeah. What is one of the most important things that we could do for love? In my, I only speak from my experience. I believed in love. Hmm. Love is, is a funny thing because it sort of can be drained from things. And again, maybe it's a masculine feminine. If we move into this too masculine, it drips the inspiration from it. But I believe in love. I believe that love is a valuable resource, just like I believe the rainforest. The reason I don't want fracking 
I don't want to infect natural water resources. I don't want to infect love. I believe in love as a transformative resource. So you could try that if you wanted. You could try believing in it. And finally, one last question I have for you. This has just been so beautiful. Thank you so much. What is one thing that I personally and our beautiful listeners out there can do to serve you today? Oh, that is a beautiful question. I've never had an interviewer say that. Um, I suppose I I think you're giving me permission to speak personally. I'm not going to speak like magnanimously about uh, the human race, what we could do, but personally, um, people can go to my my website, ben-lee.com and sign up for my mailing list because my rate of creativity, it moves very quickly, my interests and my thoughts. And the mainstream, if you look at the mainstream media's perception of somebody like me, it's like a lot of my projects, they sort of, they don't even get caught in the colander because they happen quickly at a small scale and I just do them and then they're done. So having that direct access where I can share my projects with you would be, I, I really value that. So I have a little mailing list. I send out email once a month. If you went to ben Uh I would be appreciative. Hopefully it adds value to your life. And we'll put the link to your website in the show notes. And I'm going to go and sign up right now. And I just, before we go, I just want to acknowledge you. And first of all, thank you for gifting us with your time, your wisdom and your presence and your energy and your love today. I'm extremely grateful. I have loved this conversation so much. I have spent almost the whole conversation with my eyes closed, just feeling where your words are coming from. And you are such a beautiful person and I'm very, very grateful. So thank you so much. Melissa, thank you. And thank you for um, creating a space. I was thinking, you know, as you're having an experience, you're also observing it. And I was thinking, I know your podcast has done very well. I haven't listened to any of them yet. I'm going to listen to them. But um, I could tell why. Through this whole interview, I actually felt you were present. And I think what separates someone who can do this really well from someone who can't is you you have the courage to show up in the conversation. And so I don't think that's a small thing. You know, we actually need to listen to each other and we need to connect. So it's also a service for you to create a platform where and be receptive and listen. So it's very beautiful. So thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure, Ben. Thank you. What a beautiful human being. What an amazing conversation. I could have spoken to him for hours. I know I say that with every episode, but this one in particular. What a beautiful, beautiful man. I hope you guys got lots out of today's episode. And if you loved it, please leave me a five-star review in iTunes because that means we can get more epic humans like Ben on the show. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that Ben and I mentioned in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes. That is melissaambrosini.com forward slash 24. And you can also listen to all my other episodes there and leave me a comment because I read every single one of them. And don't forget to leave me a review and let me know what else you would like me to chat about, who you want me to talk to. I am here to be of service to you. So thank you, beautiful human being, for being here, for wanting to be the best version of yourself and for showing up for you today.
you rock. Now, if there's someone in your life that you can think of that would benefit from this episode, please share it with them right now. And until next time, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.